I'm Wendy, a relationship specialist. I'd like to welcome you to Love, Listen, Talk, Repeat, a podcast that talks all about relationships. They come in all shapes and sizes, and each one's unique. So in this podcast, I chat with guests about life events and issues that can affect relationships, as well as discussing different types of relationships that may not always fit the mould of being mainstream. There will also be some episodes where it's just me talking about something that may be helpful in your relationship. So for now, just sit back and enjoy. Hi, it's Wendy, and today I'm going to be talking to Amy Stammers. She's a mindset and self-care coach, and her business is The Teapot, it refilling the lives of Aspie's wives. Now, this can sound quite intriguing, because at first, kind of when you first hear it, what's that about? So, Amy, please t- introduce yourself and tell, tell us all what this is all about. Hi Wendy, yeah I'm Amy and um, I set up the teapot about a year ago um, because I I am a wife to uh, a man who was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome um, two two years ago now and um, last year I just felt that I needed I needed a forum um, in which I could be understood and where I could share the trials and tribulations um, and, and, and positive things about my relationship, my neurodiverse relationship. Um, and there wasn't really anything specifically for UK women. There's lots of um, online forums and groups out there, but they're quite American. And um, the American system and kind of treatment of autism is very, very different to how we perceive and treat autism in the UK. So um, I set up the teapot, which started off as a Facebook support group. And um, women just came flooding into the group um, because it was UK specific and because I. I made it a positive space. I didn't really want any negative ranting and raving because that doesn't build anyone up. I wanted a space where we could build each other up, help each other, support each other, um, have a laugh together um, about some of the things that we experience every day, but not in a nasty way, just in an understanding way. And it just really grew. And um, as, the, as the online Facebook group um, grew, I realized that actually these women were needing more support. So um, I looked into um, doing coaching, life coaching, um, specifically to, to help um, myself and the women in the teapot to to just focus more on themselves and and yeah just to just to feel better about their lives in their neurodiverse relationship that sounds great and and what a lovely thing to do because i'm sure there are lots of people out there that are in relationships and they don't they just don't get it they struggle to understand their partner's issues and, and struggle to cope at times. And yes, and to, ha- to, to have a laugh about it in a nice way, to actually joke about those things, I think is, um, and, and find joy in it, because I think that's really important to find the lighter side of things and, and actually be able to share it with like-minded people. Is, and that's, that's such a lovely thing to do. Really nice. So, I know you're, you're like um, a busy mum of two. You've got a thriving online support group and business, as you said. And um, just thinking, you know, what so busy that although life looks so rosy on the outside, 
you've experienced what it's like to be at the breaking point in your relationship, as I'm sure lots of people have. But can you tell us more about that? When when was that? Was that when your husband was diagnosed, or or before then, or is yeah? I, I'm really curious about that. So I'm sure everybody else is. Well, it kind of built up over over a number of years. Um, I suppose the point at which things really changed was um, as soon as I fell pregnant with, um, with our second child. It was like a switch was flicked. Oh. And um, my husband just kind of shut down and he couldn't cope. Um, the pregnancy was very planned. Um, but yeah, it just seemed to really knock him for six. Um, and it was quite difficult for me as well because I was working full time and our two year old son was in nursery full time and my husband was working um, and I had quite a bad pregnancy. Um, I suffered quite bad morning sickness, well, all day sickness in the first oh. few months. And then I suffered severe pelvic girdle pain and I was on crutches by 20 weeks pregnant. Gosh. So, um, and I was working full time and looking after our two year old son and, and my husband was just completely unavailable, both physically and emotionally. There was one, one instance when, um, our son fell ill at nursery and, um, because I was teaching, um, I couldn't have my phone turned on during lessons. So my mm -hmm. husband was the first contact um, so his mobile phone, he had, two, he had two mobile phones and his landline um, phone at, at work. Right. And, and nursery couldn't get hold of him. So at the end of the school day, I had three missed calls from nursery saying that my son needed collecting and they, that they couldn't get hold of my husband. So I ended up having to leave school, go and pick up my son, now, because I was on crutches, <gasps> it was really difficult. I couldn't lift my son into the car. I couldn't carry him out. He was really poorly, really lethargic. And so somebody from the nursery had to actually bring him out to the car, strapping in into his car seat. So, um, and then I struggled to get him in, into the house and he just fell asleep on the sofa. Anyway, I, I kept... I kept trying to get hold of my husband, couldn't get hold of him at all, just went through to voicemail, um, and he didn't come home at the normal time. It's just like, where on earth is my husband? He mm. hadn't thought to communicate what he was doing. And, um, and yeah, and I just had to stay up it, it was, and, um, and leave my son, on my poorly son, on the sofa until my husband came home. He had gone out for an impromptu um, drinks evening with colleagues and he hadn't bothered to tell me. And so he, he rolled in about 11 o'clock and um, I, I was just furious because I'd really struggled and I was tired and my son was poorly and, and he just doesn't, didn't seem bothered. He couldn't see why I was so upset. And being pregnant I just wondered if he'd even be around for the birth of our daughter mm -hmm. um I just felt so alone I felt let down unsupported so frustrated the fact that he just showed no concern for anyone but himself it was like he was completely blinkered nothing else mattered apart from him he was in his own little world um Another example, he'll, he'll cook a meal, but to his tastes, he forgets or doesn't even acknowledge the fact that I've got food intolerances and the children are really fussy eaters. And then um, the real tipping point was um, just after Christmas last year, so around February 2017. Um, I was away for the weekend and um, he said, oh, I'm going to tidy up the bedroom. It's like, OK, good. Um, he hoards paperwork and receipts. So um, I said, OK, yeah, you tidy up the paperwork then. Um, 
so then we can get into bed easier. <laughs> and um, he ended up just concentrating on my paperwork and he completely emptied my memory box and threw all my stuff away. So I had photos, I had letters from my grandparents, I had programs from concerts and plays that I'd been in, all gone. Oh. I was livid and so, so hurt and upset. And yet, he just didn't realise that anything was wrong. He didn't see why I was upset. He said, well, I've sorted out the paperwork. Goodness me, I can't imagine what that felt like for you. Yeah. Um, it's, so, and there's lots of little things like that. It's just, it's just infuriating, the fact that he cannot see anything from other people's point of view. It's his way or the highway, basically. Oh, um, right. And the lack of communication is just, it's just, yeah, it's a really big issue. And it's just like living with a sulky housemate, basically. <laughs> oh, oh, Amy. That that must be really tough because I can't imagine living with anybody who's sulky. I mean, it would just be really testing my patience no end, I have to say. So when you met your husband, was did he have, a, a, you know, Asperger's then? Or has it developed? I'm curious about that. Um, well, he was, he's always been introverted. Um, right. And he's always been considered a bit of an eccentric. Okay. And he's found relationships very difficult in the past. I was really his first serious girlfriend. And he was late 30s when we met. Um, and we went for pre-marriage counselling um, because we were having a few issues and unbeknown to us the counsellor was actually a specialist in Asperger's syndrome because her husband had been diagnosed uh, kind of in midlife and um, we got talking and we got talking about my husband's family and um, we got talking about my husband and some of the things that he did and the counsellor just said have you considered that you might have Asperger's and so um she gave us some literature and I read it and I said oh my gosh this is my husband down to a T um so yeah so many questions were answered um and it actually helped my husband to realize why he was like he was and it really helped him to actually um gain a better sense of identity um but we just left it we left it there until um later on when um when things got really bad so right so things so you're saying that they're they've they've um become increasingly more difficult yeah yeah, yeah. that's tough because i guess when you you first hear of any kind of um, situation like that with a sub and scorch, a condition you and you're madly in love with someone and you just think oh we can get through this it'll be fine and and, exactly. and <laughs> yeah and it doesn't seem that bad to start with it's just as you say when situations like you're pregnant and your son's ill and you're on crutches and you can't get hold of him or yeah losing your memory box that that's you know all those kinds of things are really they're tough aren't they because they're special, well, diff, very difficult moments in the first case, but the second one, yeah, your memory box, you can't, you can't bring that back. So I wonder, is that, do you end up feeling resentful? Yeah, quite a bit, actually. But I have to, I have to think he can't help it. No. That's just the way his brain is wired. And I really have to... Um, I have to think about how I react emotionally to the things that he does. Yes, and I think that is important for any of us, whatever situation we're in, is to be aware of how we react to 
other people because we can't change them, but we can change our responses. So I think there's something very valuable in that in anybody's life, but certainly with somebody who's got that condition. Yeah. Wow. So what, how have you got support? Where did you go for support when you were struggling with this? Well, I, I talked to friends, but I didn't really find that very useful. They said, oh, well, he's just typical man. <laughs> I like, yes, but, um, and in doing my research about um, Asperger's, um, I've learned that there's actually increasing psychological evidence for extreme male brain theory of autism. So you could say that autism um, is just extreme maleness. Okay. And the partners of um, the partners of Aspies are often um, hyper empaths, so extreme females, so extreme female mm. traits, and so they go really well together. Hyper empaths and um, Aspies, they kind of complement each other. Um, so yeah, I started to um, I started to do more research into um, Aspergers. Um, and started to look for some online support groups um, where I could kind of vent and and just hear other people's experiences and compare them to what I was going through. Um, and basically, things started getting difficult for my for my husband at work. Um, he couldn't cope with work. And then the busyness of life at home with two young children. Mm. Um, and so he was getting distracted at work and he wasn't following through and making careless mistakes. And this was leading to kind of multiple disciplinaries. And um, yeah, I really needed to, to do something um, to support to support my family really um and to support my husband and support you well yeah yeah <laughs> because that's really important you know we can't support anybody else unless we're in, we, you know we're in it we take care of ourselves first but i i imagine trying trying to juggle all that is it can take quite a toll on you um and so i think supporting yourself and finding a place where you get support and any partner in that situation or, or family member, I think that's really, really important because you can't, you can't support others unless you're okay yourself. And I get the sense that at times it is very testing for you. Yeah, definitely. And I wonder whether those support groups getting that, it makes sense of it. You know, if you're, if you're with others who are in a similar situation, you it makes a bit more sense. Go, I'm not the only one. Yeah, oh, very much. Yeah, we're kind of shoulder to shoulder, um, sharing the burden, really. Yeah, yeah, and normalising, normalising it in a way that you, in that situation. I mean, there's nothing normally under the sun, but actually feeling that this isn't a person who doesn't care about me. It's a condition that affects their behaviour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and 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 actually. It, acknowledging that and getting that that confirmation in a way i should imagine that would be really helpful to you and all the others out there who struggle yeah yeah and i guess there is a thing there's something because um i do work with with people who have asperger's they're on that that you know on that continuum and i they come to me and they say well do you understand about it and i well that's not important for me. What's important for me is to understand how it affects your life or your partner's life or your relationship. Because that's the important bit, isn't it? You, you know, nothing is, you get that label and then it, well, yes, but how does it affect you? That's the important part for me. And so I don't feel I have to know every single part about a condition, but understanding what's affecting that person or their relationship. Hmm. and I guess that's the same for you that when you talk to others that everybody's got a different situation or there's a 
they're in a, a different situation, you know, it's affecting their lives differently, but it is that what they need. Oh, very much, yes, yeah. Rather than pigeonholing people, because people will get pigeonholed, don't they? And they oh, well, that's your problem. And then you get treated in a particular way. Well, that doesn't always help that person. <laughs> <laughs> So at what point did you take back control and how did you do it? Well, um, with my husband getting multiple disciplinaries at work, I was really worried about the prospect of him losing his job. Yeah. So I had a three-year-old and a newborn baby. So I wasn't in a position to go back to work. Um, and he was about as useful as a chocolate teapot at home. And he was very depressed. Mm. So I actually gave him an ultimatum. I said, right, go and get assessed for autism. Otherwise, I'm leaving you. Um, there's a kind of phrase, is he AS or is he an ass?" <laughs> 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 so, yeah. So, because there's, there's quite a fine line, as he was saying, about is the behaviour to do with the condition or is he just, is he just like not... Does he just not care? Yes. So, um, so yeah, he was diagnosed in April 2017. Um, really easy process, actually, um, here in Oxford. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, I just hoped and prayed that he would get a diagnosis because it was the only way to explain his behaviour. Mm. So, really pleased that he did get a diagnosis and it also protects him at work so he's got it on his um hr file so basically if they try to um sack him or make him redundant because of things that have come up because of his aspergers then they cannot do that because it's basically against disciplinary act or whatever yeah so now at work um so we just poodled on <laughs> for about another year but then i hit rock bo rock bottom nothing mm. had diagnosis but i i realized that he was incapable of changing that was how his brain was wired and he yeah he couldn't change who he was and how he was so um so there I was with two young children a very depressed husband and I just thought this is ridiculous I'm just giving 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 I need to focus on myself um I'd actually trained in hypnobirthing and I learned a lot of self-care and relaxation techniques and um so I was busy teaching that to other people and I was thinking I've got to practice what I preach here and so I took back control of my life and I started to refill my cup through doing um, self-care and relaxation and, um, yeah, just focusing on myself, really. So important because, as you said, your cup was completely empty. So ref refilling your cup is so important. And I, that's where the analogy of the... Well, the metaphor of the teapot comes in. I think that's exactly a, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good, and it, it would appeal to the British, wouldn't it? Because you know we do love our cup of tea. Oh yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure that was that's um, uh, really relevant um, to a lot of of us Brits. <laughs> so that that sounds good. So you you do a lot of self care, as you say, you with relaxation and and coping with it yourself and I think that acknowledgement that he's not going to change that's his condition and therefore that's it the only, well you know as I say that the only one person who can change is ourselves so that is that's important to recognize that we have no control over everyone anyone else do we have their thoughts words actions whether they have a condition or not that's it the only person we have control over is ourselves so yeah. yeah, really. What have you learnt so far on your journey? That I've got to put myself first. That's my main takeaway. And that's what 
I say to everyone who comes to the teapot. I mean, it's, it's the same in any codependent relationship, whether your partner's an addict, a workaholic, has a disability or a chronic illness. You just can't give, give, give all the time. It's not sustainable. You've got to draw a line and put boundaries in place. Um, I've learned how to say no. And I've learned to focus on myself and my emotional and physical well-being. Um, I've also had to do a lot of letting go of expectations. Mm. And I've also had to grieve for the loss of a marriage relationship that I'm never going to have. So um, I think like at the beginning of our marriage, even though um, it was suggested that my husband had Asperger's, um, yeah, I thought, oh, that's okay. We all, we all got on okay. And, um, but yeah, I, I never expected things to get as bad as they did. And so it's, yeah, it's really letting go of all those expectations that you have of yeah. what, what, the, what your ideal relationship is, is, going, is like. It's not always rosy. You do have to work at relationships. Yeah. And, um, and, yeah, and I... Um, we mentioned before about reacting. I've, I've really had to change how I react to my husband's behaviours um, and really change my mindset about things. So that's why I'm a mindset and self-care coach because I know that it's mindset and self-care that is really, really important in successfully living in a neurodiverse relationship yes i think that's um really interesting and i think the analogy that i use when i i, I talk to my clients and i use the analogy of the um when you're on a plane and you you're, you receive the safety instructions and i say to say to someone have you flown yeah um, do you remember what they are told when you are taken through the safety instructions? Well, sort of. Okay. What do they tell you about the oxygen mask? Um, yeah. And if they remember it will be, oh yeah, put it on me first. So why do they say that? Why do you think that is? Um, and you see people are so vague about it. They have probably not listened to the instructions and they have no concept of what that's about. So, okay, so if you put that mask on somebody else first, where would your oxygen come from? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I need to put it on myself first then before I could help anyone else. And that's what you need to do in life. That's the self-care. But it's fascinating that people don't really appreciate that they need to have themselves in a good place before they could help anybody else at all. And then another question I ask is, uh, who's the most important? Who comes first in your life, you know, priority? They run through a whole list of people, even down to the cat, the dog, <laughs> the hamster, everybody else. Where do you come? Well, I don't. So. If you don't put yourself in, that, in there, if you don't put yourself at the top of the list, how on earth can you cope and look after anybody else? Mm. And it's amazing how often people don't have that perception. I'm sure you come across it too. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I've been there myself. Yeah. I think that's it, isn't it? Um, mums especially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the kids have to come first. Actually, no, we have to come first, and that is really important. It's, I just think you've explained so much today, Amy, and you've shared so much. Is there anything else that you want to share that I haven't asked you or we haven't covered so far? Um, no, I think we've we've covered everything that I wanted to talk about. Um. I was just going to say, if 
um, what I've been talking about resonates with anyone listening um, and feels that they're in a similar situation or suspects that their partner has Asperger's, then I'd love you to, um, to take a look at my website, which is www.refillingyourcup.com and um, you can access the Facebook group from the website. Um, we have meetups in the Oxford area. Um, I've got a retreat day coming up in Oxfordshire and, um, and I offer um, coaching sessions and I'd just love to talk with you and support you in refilling your cup. Oh, that's really great. And you've got some uh, amazing things going on and that are supporting um, partners of those with Aspies. So that's great. And all the details will be in the show notes. Um, so if you haven't picked up on all of these, you can, pick, you can um, find them in the show notes. Thank you so much, Amy. I've really enjoyed talking to you today. It's been really informative and helpful. And I really hope that it uh, helps those in a similar situation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy, for having me on. It's been, it's been really great to talk about um, my journey and how I can help other people. Great, thank you. So you can find all the information about this show in the show notes. And you can find lots more on my website, www.yourrelationshipspecialist.co.uk including the link to my podcast and you can also sign up for my newsletter which has lots more tips and offers so until next time bye for now